All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining us. This is our final um, public service perspectives presentation of the fall semester um, today. So thank you all for taking your lunch hour to join us and hear from our speaker. Um, before we get started, just want to remind you of our typical housekeeping remarks. Um, you know, if you are not speaking, we ask that you remain muted just to avoid any disruptions. Um, we do and we'd love to hear from you though. So feel free to use the chat. Um, you can raise your hand throughout and we'd be happy to have this be a really interactive session today. Um, you can drop any questions in the chat. Um, we'll be doing Q&A at the end and a little bit throughout um, if we have some immediate questions. So feel free to put those in the chat or you can use the raise your hand feature to ask aloud. Um, if comfortable and if internet bandwidth allows, um, we'd love to see you all. So please feel free to have your camera on throughout today's presentation. Also, this session is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel in the coming weeks. Um, if anyone has any announcements or any um, events or updates to share before we get started, I welcome you to go ahead and do so at this time. All right. Seems like they're, it's the end of the year. Everyone's winding down. There's nothing going on at the end of the semester just to get through finals and, and those graduate, graduate on time this fall. Um, so I'll go ahead and get ready to turn it over to Dr. Ani Ruhil to introduce our speaker. Um, before I do so, I ask one more thing of you all. Um, we just love to find out, you know, who you are. Are you a student? Are you a professional working in the industry? So if you could drop that in the chat, um, you know, let us know if you're a student, what you're studying. Um, we would love to, to know who's, who's joining us today. Um, and with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Ruhil. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Mackenzie. Um, well, it's my distinct pleasure, and I say this with all sincerity, to, to welcome Tim Saar. Um, I'll talk about his, you know, some of the things he's done and he's involved with at the moment briefly. But I also want to welcome Jordan Plotner, who's uh, the Director of Marketing and Communications at the <coughs> Colleges of Medicine Government Resource Center. So Jordan, welcome, and I'm glad you could join us. And of course, um, our main speaker of the day is Mr. Saar. Um, and Mr. Saar wears many hats, and so I always have to be careful that I get this right, starting with his title. So he is the Director of Research and Analytics at the Ohio Colleges of Medicine Government Resource Center. Um, he directs various research and applied projects relating to healthcare systems, health risk behaviors, public health, and the health status of Ohioans. Um, at the moment, he is the principal or the co-principal investigator for the 2021 Ohio Medicaid Assessment Survey the 2021 Ohio Medicaid Release Enrollees Evaluation, the Ohio COVID-19 study or the survey, the Ohio Schools COVID-19 Evaluation, and the 2021 Ohio Pregnancy Assessment Survey, um, amongst many other projects that he's actually involved with. Prior to joining the GRC, he was the Director of Research at the Health Policy Institute of Ohio. He was the Head of Research at the Franklin County Ohio Board of Health and a survey and social researcher with Gallup. Um, he holds graduate degrees from Princeton and Ohio State, was an honors program student at the University of Oxford, and he has many riveting tales to tell about the, that sojourn, but we won't have time today. And he attended Anderson University. So with that, Tim, I welcome and thank you for making time to speak with us about the various things that you're doing out there. Thank you, Ani. Um, and everybody, um, the presentation is being given you because whatever Ani asks us to do, we do. Um, so what we've uh, tried to do with this is do almost like um, a machine gun approach. There's a lot here. Uh, we're going to go conversational. I have no problem if everybody interrupting, we can get through it. Um, and the approach uh, that we use when we do these kind of surveys or just about any research at GOC is try to give a grounded reality um, on uh, the overall state of health, um, in particular for Medicaid, the Department of Health, Mental Health, and all the state agencies. The GRC is an entity that has uh, was uh, constituted by the Board of Regents uh, with the seven colleges of medicine in the state. And we have partnerships with all the schools that have health associated um, uh, programs, academic programs. And we've had a long running relationship uh, since our beginning with OU. <clears throat> and we first worked with Dr. Ruhill before the GRC was even established uh, when he first got here. 
so um, we're strong believers uh, in serving populations, in particular Appalachia. Uh, and thanks to uh, Dr. Ruhill and Dr. Lewis's influences, have even done chart books related to Appalachia, which you can find on the web if you need. Uh, and so with that, uh, let's go. Again, feel free to interrupt. Um, so why grounded? Uh, information because uh, basically the state needs periodical policy checks, service needs, and assumptions for how they serve the state of Ohio um, updated. And so what you have that we do as a function is often people will, um, often legislators will have different types of advocates, associations, whatever, give them positions, and we often serve the check against those claims. Um, and we also check against claims related to local state government, sometimes federal government, on rules, laws, regulations, and legitimations for that kind of stuff. We also serve basically to do uh, overall population-based tracking for the state. And currently, uh, we're in the midst of about 19 surveys, in all honesty, and five of those are work as extension. Now, that's an interesting thing we do here that most people don't do, which means we do surveys uh, for entities, state agencies, as an extension to the state agency for internal discussions, uh, budget needs, and things like that. And uh, when we have those, we never show them. So let's get right into the select findings. By the way, they're select because the OMAS is very big and uh, we couldn't go through all of it. The OMAS is the Ohio Medicaid Assessment Survey. Uh, for those of you who have been around a while, uh, in 1998, it was the Ohio Family Health Survey. Uh, for those of you who really go back, uh, in 1994, which we don't line up as an iteration, uh, it was the experiment experimental uh, behavior risk factor survey with the CDC and NIH. Uh, I had come out of Gallup and uh, the state tapped the shoulder and said, can you do that? And we did do that in 94. Uh, we found that there was discrepancy between what most, as many of the agencies, local and state, thought was the status of the population versus what we found. That gave rise to discussions in 1997 to do the Ohio Family Health Survey so that Ohio could have the best possible information, again, for their operations and their budget, things like that. Uh, the partnership is big, uh, really big. And there's the listing here. And again, in terms of magnitude of impact for the university side of it, it is Ohio State University and, and, and OU as the primary drivers. Next, please. The background, again, is to provide uh, data supporting policy, uh, strategic development, and the efficient and effective operation of the Medicaid program. This is under uh, MedTAP, which uh, the Secretary of HHS uh, and CMS uh, basically allow to co-fund state projects if it helps the Medicaid program. We do the population as a whole, by the way, because of the potentially eligible for Medicaid or people who may have their socioeconomic status slide and then fall into Medicaid. It is the key research data set uh, for tracking of indicators uh, in the state of Ohio and it's ex accepted as such by the Office of the Governor. And um, ask me later why this matters, believe it or not, the state library. And that does matter because it means it's referential material. It can be used in legislation and things like that without question. The main topics are these. Um, there are more than this, but these are the ones that most people want to talk about. Next, please. The method summary is OMAS. Um, <clears throat> we use primarily existing questions from a variety of places. Uh, over the years, we go through uh, pretty much the NORC Gallup standard for developing questions. Uh, by the way, we cognitively review every instrument uh, we ever put in the field with people in the community. And it's always very humorous how uh, a bunch of applied academics or pure academics think that they got something right because they're talking to each other. You take it into the community and people on the west side of Columbus or in Newark, Ohio or Athens, Ohio, just destroy it. And so you go back to it and do it again. 
in the end, it has to be understandable to the respondent. Um, <clears throat> the administrative methods were cell phone, landline, uh, and ABS. Um, this time around, we were 30,068 adults, 7,118 child interviews. The child interviews were proxy. Next, please. All right, Sp uh, spend some time on this, please. <clears throat> this is the kind of information that we track over the years. Now, 1998, we had some, uh, we used a different definition of what it meant to be not working. So if you were a student, you should be saying, well, is this the unemployment rate? And then we should get back to you and say, it is not. A guy named John Iceland, who, if you haven't read his book, uh, his little manual on different types of measurement of poverty, I highly recommend everybody read. And then I'll tell John that we recommended you to him. Um, <clears throat> when you're considering social service entities and agencies, the unemployment rate in 1982 under the Reagan administration, if uh, some of you go back that far, changed to where you were not working, you were looking for work, you were in somebody's system, you were being tracked, and there was a benefit associated determinant to the definition. Most of the social scientists and, and, and many of the people who are social epidemiologists like me, that makes no sense. Really what makes sense is in fact, the simple concept of not working. Now, Iceland's people would tell you if your economy for 19, 18 or 19 to 64 year olds is at 22% or 24% not working, your economy's humming. And the reason for that is many people retire early. Some people decide they wanna stay at home and be stay at home parents. Um, some people churn, some people go back to school and leave the workforce only to re-enter. So if you're at 22 to 24, you're doing great. Ohio has had a constant issue with being above the great standard. Now that is normal for the Great Lake states, everybody, because we are still in a Rust Belt. And agricultural uh, Appalachia, it has been having troubles since the middle 1960s. And that's not just Ohio, that's West Virginia, Pennsylvania, parts of New York. So if you're looking at a chart like this and you're the state, the instant question is, well, how'd you get a 5% raise in 2008? And that's the financial collapse. When we did the 2008 survey, we actually took the day that Shearson Lehman collapsed. We were in the field, almost at the 50% mark. And we put a marker in a data set pre-Shearson, post-Shearson. It was interesting to watch what would happen with all kinds of health indicators, alcohol consumption, a variety of other things related to the delay um, about two to three weeks after Shearson collapsed. If you go then to 2019, we hit 28.5. We were all elated. So then we went because we have the Ohio uh, Medicaid um, <clears throat> COVID-19 study and the Ohio COVID-19 study matching up. We've been in the field every day since April 2020. Uh, and we still are tracking the pandemic and the socioeconomic uh, indicators and distressors of the pandemic. <clears throat> we estimate that we're, we in 2020, and this would be uh, July of 2020, jumped to about 47.2% uh, not working rate. So all the gains we had made since the real estate collapse went away. Now, uh, this is adjusted down now we're working on that now and we are in the field with the 2021 omos and looking at data and that 47.2 has uh backed off some but we're we're not even going to be close to 28.5 next slide please and those are the counts and again those are counts against uh about 7 million people eligible for the workforce between 19 and 64 years of age next please and if you're wondering um, how we set what you're going to see next related to poverty indicators, these are the 2019 federal poverty guidelines. The 138% FPL is in there because that is the ACA's cutoff in the state of Ohio for being Medicaid eligible or not a Medicaid eligible. Next, please. 
This we decided to do uh, working with AHRQ uh, to see, um, given the insurance fluctuations um, because of people losing work related to a variety of things, um, what it would cost for uh, sponsored premiums, employer cost sponsored premiums for a singlet. In other words, somebody who's not going after family coverage. It's outstandingly high. And the estimate for 2013 was 15,955 for an 80-20 um, plan payment by firm, payment, co-payment by individual. Next, please. So <clears throat> you take that and you're trying to figure out not working versus poverty versus the overall SES status of the population. You have to take into uh, account not just ESI as a burden of overall, what is, and this is also informed by Iceland, what would be the relative poverty rate for the population? Remember, you have an absolute poverty rate and most people consider at the federal poverty level. I'm trying to help anybody that's gonna deal with this with their uh, master's thesis or whatever. You have the functional poverty level uh, that basically is you could have 500% of the federal poverty level is your income. If you don't have insurance and you have colorectal cancer, you're functionally broke because of the cost. And that was relative. This is the housing expense rate. This is medium rent as share of household income by county, and then inflation adjusted median gross rent by county. Uh, well, can you go back here? If you notice, uh, the super dark tends to be in the Appalachian region on both, with the exception of uh, Moro. So next, please. This is where we uh, need to spend a little time uh, to give you an example of some of the things that we look at. In the 1994 uh, Burfus, we asked about employee-sponsored insurance with any type of employee-sponsored insurance disregarding the benefit structure. In 1994, it was around 67%. In 2019, it's 49.8. And from early indicators for the 2021 OMAS, we think we're down to 47%. And that gives us overall a 20 percentage point drop in ESI, employee sponsored insurance, uh, for the state of Ohio since. 1994, reporting here 1998 to 2019. So you're supposed to ask, well, why does that matter? Because things like the 1115A, 1115A work waiver for Medicaid and things like uh, adjustment benefits for the Ohio Department of Insurance assume that if in fact you knock people, if people get back to work and you knock people off insurance, that they will in fact, um, basically go to ESI. When we talk with, in the Ohio Employer Health Survey companies and then insurers, the truth is insurance has priced itself away from a significant section of the population. So Dr. Sieber, myself, uh, some others, uh, constantly look at what's happening with ESI and try to figure out using OMAS as the baseline and then extra data and, and input and qualitative interviews and things like that to try and get at the explanatory reasons. And actually, it appears ESI is going down because it basically cannot be afforded by many people, which is why you saw um, the expense, the core expense uh, uh, ratio uh, to income prior to this. Does this make sense? Now I will stop and ask if anybody has a question about this. And if so, speak up or whatever. This is very important, by the way, because you have to ask yourself, <clears throat> if you're going to balance the state budget by curtailing Medicaid, and you presuppose that by a social initiative, you can basically get more people in ESI, the assumption is, uh, in fact, we think, and many people who work with us, not that easy. Go ahead, Jack. Uh, yeah, if 
So if, I, if I'm understanding you then, I mean, what you were looking at would be, for instance, the, the imp imposition of work requirements mm -hmm. that would presume that, uh, you know, if it, was, if it were successful, which work programs have never been successful in, in means tested programs, but if it were, you would be moving people off Medicaid and in, into the private sector market. And basically your, your research is showing that it's highly unlikely that they they would have been, been able to retain their health insurance. They simply would have been cut off Medicaid and unable to afford private insurance. Is That's that exactly right, Jack. And the truth is, if you go to the relative uh, need base of the average family, then what you would be doing is forcing people into making decisions whether, and we have asked, asked people in qualitatives, uh, would you pay for insurance or heat? Would you pay for insurance or clothing or a coat for your kid? Sure. What about tires so that you have reliable transportation back and forth to work? Right. They always, uh, they walk away from insurance. And the reason they walk away from insurance is uh, many people tell us that if I watch what I'm doing, I won't need it so quickly, but I can't do without the other. And so what's happening is you're really uh, policy-wise dancing to almost the point of zero sum. Now, for people in this state. What, was this information available when the legislature decided to go yes. ahead and implement the work programs anyway? Yes, and it is one of the reasons that the agencies decided to accept all the waiver, all the exceptions right. that ended up causing debate. And we um, the, we do the Ohio uh, we do the we do the waiver program. Right. Uh, even though it's canceled now, and we do the uh, ACA um, effects survey to boot. And the truth is, uh, the agencies took all this very seriously because they, you know, they would ask us, "Well, is there a place we can go?" There's not. The margins are too thin for the state population as a whole. Thank so, you for doing this, by the way. No, no, that's all right. Um, and the state, I thought, uh, did exactly what they should have. They put the exceptions in so that, in fact, uh, those relative numbers we showed you earlier uh, carried the day. And they're like, uh, we're going to put all these exceptions in because we're just setting the whole system up for failure if we don't. And, and they were right. They did the right thing. Right. Next, please. So uh, enrolled in Medicaid, as you would expect, uh, the enrollment in Medicaid in 2019 went down a bit because we started coming back, if you saw earlier, on the economy. Now, since the, uh, the, the preliminary data for the 2021 shows that, in fact, uh, enrollment in Medicaid has jacked up quite a bit uh, in, in Appalachia, which always runs about four to five percentage points higher than the rest of the state. Uh, but for all groupings across the state, all races, with the fastest increase, by the way, being, uh, believe it or not, 45-year-old and older white males, which is kind of interesting. And that, uh, at my old advisor in New Jersey, that is Angus Deaton and Ann Case's argument, if you haven't read Angus's work, and I highly recommend you do. Uh, so... Um, these numbers are underrepresenting the current state. Uh, we know that from uh, we are at the 75% completion rate on the 2021 OMAS. Um, these numbers are going to jump way up. And they've stayed up because as a public health emergency, Medicaid is not doing redetermination of whether or not you should be on Medicaid uh, by CMS uh, guidance and by state of Ohio uh, agreement. And uh, give it up to Ohio, we went to that decision very early. And so we are expecting when redetermination starts hitting again, uh, they were thinking that we would come out on the other end of Delta, but now with Omicron, that's suspended again, um, at least for the time being. Uh, the number uh, isn't 19.8, it's about 24, we estimate which means about one in every four people in the state of Ohio is covered by Medicaid. Now, uh, insurance coverages for parents, we've had a lot of questions about parents, and in particular, uh, parents on Medicaid at 138%, ESI and uninsured, 
if you look at the ESI number and uh, you heard Jack's question earlier, this should make all the sense in the world to you. Parents are having a hard time and rightfully so. Next, please. Thank you. If you look at children, the situation uh, blows higher. So for all at 138% of poverty and below, the child coverage rate is 78.4% of that population. Again, if you consider the question that Jack asked, um, if you consider the question that Jack asked, um, the, uh, you're at 12.7%. Again, when we go into the field and we always follow, by the way, for the most part, uh, on key issues, qualitative interviews to quantitative data. Uh, a lot of people don't do that. It is an old Gallup trick I learned many years ago. Um, and we don't assume sometimes that how we interpret these findings as policy wonks are necessarily the interpretation of the people who gave us the response would interpret it. And the bottom line again is on a 12.7%, 12, 12 they can't afford it. But Ohio does really well across the board uh, at not uh, having uninsured kids, in particular given the 80s and the early 90s where we were always in the double digits. For us, uh, and give it up to our state, uh, uninsured children are a rare event. It's under 5%. Next, please. So we did a bunch of chart books. We like to say that we're the group of people who will go after anything if we think that um, it helps inform how to help people. So we do behavioral health. 3.6% uh, of children, 5 to 11 and 4.9 experience frequent mental distress. Uh, that's about the norm uh, for the Great Lakes states. That's less than the South. 8.8% of working class adults report mental health impairment. Uh, meaning not being able to function routinely for at least 14 of the last 30 days prior to being interviewed. That's a CDC question. For the most part, that's okay. I mean, it's not great, but we're in the middle of the pack. MHI is highest for young women. That is nationwide. And lowest uh, for late middle-aged men. That, in fact, is also the norm. The confound of that, in one sense, or... or interaction term maybe, is uh, the amount of uh, insurance transition for late middle-aged men. Uh, and we haven't figured that out yet, but uh, the, the numbers here are pretty consistent. Next slide, please. So if you look at child and adolescent health, um, ESI is, uh, has steadily declined, as we mentioned, and that is a policy disaster for a lot of people. Uh, and it has declined for, again, as you saw, adults and kids. Uh, Medicaid enrollment's up and Medicaid youth are up and, and very consistent. The blessing of Medicaid youth, by the way, is they do now cover dental visits and a variety of other things uh, that are helpful. And by the way, if you're old enough like me, were not the case years ago. So uh, it's more comprehensive, in particular for, uh, for children and uh, uh, women of childbearing age. Next, please. And now, ACEs. Um, the state of Ohio has had problems. If you look at medical records review, which we do, uh, with adverse childhood experiences, ACEs, which is a classification uh, set up for relative risk uh, by the CDC and the National Institutes of Health. So um, for us, um, ACEs are more prevalent with Medicaid enrolled youth which you'd expect because it associates with lower socioeconomic status, also associates uh, uh, with as lower economic status, disrupted families. Uh, usually, often you don't have two parents. Uh, also disrupted households, residential issues, uh, risk neighborhoods, and a variety of other things. Among all higher youth, black uh, youth were more likely to have experienced any ACE um, among all higher youth, 64.8% uh, had ever experienced NACE, white 50.3% and 60.3% for Hispanic youth. Now that's a, a question, if you can go back a minute. 
that is something that the Department of Health and the Department of Medicaid and the Department of Men Mental Health and Addiction Services wanted us to concentrate on. These are the numbers they wanted, but for the most part, your most extreme situations are, pe are, are kids or family units that suffer three or more ACEs. And we will be looking at that again in 2021. We looked at it prior. I'd recommend everybody go to the GRC website for the OMAS that you'll see in the end and pull down uh, the ACEs chart book. Uh, and across the board, uh, the state is struggling in the area of ACEs and uh, adverse experiences for children. Next, please. Um, and so um, Medicaid wanted me to put this in here, but I'll let you uh, look at that yourself on what they drew out of all of our work form and surveys, uh, strategies to manage populations. Next, this is just reference life course of good health. This came out of our work. Next, please. The issue of the impact spaces. Next, please. Um, our, the ultimate goal. Next, please. And uh, abuse, neglect, household dysfunction. Next, please. ACEs dramatic, and this is straight from us. ACEs dramatically increased the risk of nine, 10 children leading to cause of death in the US. Next, please. And that's for kids. Um, and we showed you that to let you know that, in fact, nicely uh, agencies use all this data and they brand it as their own. The nice thing about the OMAS being owned by everybody, it's OK for anybody to brand it on their own. And whoever keeps sending me the, uh, the messages up, can your people get access to this data? Go, you'll see this in the end. Go to Dr. Ruhill uh, or Dr. Uh, uh, Lewis and basically make the request and they'll channel it. And of course you can get the data and we'll help you with it. Chronic diseases, Ohio is kind of high in chronic diseases. 18 point, have ever been told they have two or more chronics. Uh, you go with two or more chronics because um, basically chronics tend to dance with each other and two or more basically decreases, uh, or basically decreases years of productive life, life expectancy, and uh, uh, life course function. Uh, women uh, more often report a diagnosis of chronics and then men. Uh, Medicaid's higher. Um, insurance plays in. Uh, it's not necessarily that we're making a causal, a causal uh, claim to that, but it clusters. If you're an epi, you will understand what that means. And education obviously plays into this immensely. Next, please. By the way, the education, when we go out and we um, qualitatively interview with them about that, the education is as much health education as it is raw education. People uh, cope by dosing all the time, right? I cope every morning when I get up with as much coffee as I can shove in my system. You know, ani has got his coffee sitting on his desk in a box. Um, the, the truth is that um, we know that people dose. And we know that people who uh, have attained less education or uh, have little education dose quite a bit. So if you're asking why is it that all these health things carry over to education, a lot of it has to do with not just environment, but also uh, people sliding into different ways of dealing with life stressors or, or, or a variety of other things. Employment, more than two fifths of adult Medicaid employees were actively employed. Uh, that's higher than many people who are elected tell us that they think it is. And again, that's using the not working rate, by the way, everyone. So remember, you have not working in there because people are trying to strive for different things, uh, education, whatever. Uh, for all Highlands not working, leading barriers are physical or mental health limitations. That's not just Medicaid, by the way, that's all high ones. Uh, caring for a family member and not being able to find work, uh, usually related to workforce preparation uh, in terms of stock of knowledge and stock of skills. Uh, for all high ones not working and looking for work, but unable to find a job, most common barriers are additional skills through school training, transportation issues, uh, and really we should have named that transportation family and employer background checks actually, interestingly, 
uh, is a barrier to many people being able to get a job. Um, in terms of Medicaid expansion longevity, uh, as of December 2019, approximately half were continuously enrolled and less than a quarter were continuously enrolled. And uh, the back part of that bullet isn't there, which is interesting. Uh, for those who are not continuously enrolled, employment is less. In other words, if you're training in Medicaid, you're, uh, you would think that somebody got off Medicaid because they had a job. That may be, but your longevity for employment is actually less. Next, please. Housing. Uh, Ohio suffers from housing insecurity immensely. Uh, we didn't expect to see this when we did this. 40% uh, of all Ohioans experience some form of housing insecurity. Now, remember, um, housing insecure is 30% or more. In one, uh, housing insecure is not just moving or evictions. A more general denominator is that you're spending 30% or more of your gross income on housing. You're extremely housing insecure if you're spending 50% or more, and this is pre-tax, on housing. That gave rise to why we went again with the relative uh, financial expense need to put back against that, and then all the chips fell in order and it made sense. Medicaid enrollees more likely than other Ohioans to experiencing housing insecurity. Um, they were uh, 29.8 who were severely cost burdened and 4.1 who were homeless or living in shelters or other temporary housing. Now that comes out of uh, the OMAS data and that's checked for all of you that love to get into Medicaid and Medicare data with the Z codes, the Z scores uh, in the Medicaid data. Uh, if you're gonna get into Medicaid data, you definitely wanna get into the Z scores. And that is uh, estimations uh, and, and the Medicaid administrative data of who, in fact, is homeless or highly housing insecure. Their data has enough holes and missing data that it's a great statistical and mathematical challenge. Uh, but when you put it against independent sources like the OMAS or the OMRES or some of the other Medicaid or population studies we do, they kind of, at least for reasons, uh, kind of can group together. And housing insecurity is associated with a greater likelihood of uh, fair to poor health status and mental health impairment and more frequent emergency room visits than you would expect that. Minority health in the state of Ohio, uh, we basically boil down to um, unmet needs are higher for uh, blacks and Hispanics compared to whites, chronic conditions higher, uh, substance use uh, was mixed uh, uh, substance smoking and marijuana are higher for blacks um, and uh, opioids, however, and uh, binge drinking. Uh, Hispanics were the highest binge drinkers. Whites were right on their heels. And uh, opioid deaths were highest among whites. If you cut this, by the way, at 200% of poverty and below, uh, the drinking issue goes, uh, the drinking championship goes to whites, the opioid death still goes to whites. Economic insecurity, minorities uh, have a harder time. Incarceration, Blacks or African Americans are six times more likely to be incarcerated as a rate, by the way, per 10,000. Um, remember, everybody, when you're doing that, you can't use raw numbers because there are a lot more whites than blacks in this state. But if you do it by rate, uh, you, you have a comparison. Um, next, rural health. Um, I should let actually Ani bring this one out. This is his work. You hear me a lot, then go ahead, please. Uh, rural health, uh, rural people are more likely to report poor fair health status to be obese, uh, regardless of your insurance status or Medicaid status. Rural, non-rural with Medicaid, we're more likely to report disability <clears throat> than potentially Medicaid eligible adults. We looked into um, some of the medical records and a lot of that is related to injury uh, and, and is occupational injury. Uh, rural adults were more likely to be current smokers um, and um, rural, by far, prescription pain pill misuse, uh, opioids, and beyond. Uh, 
not all uh, prescription pain medicine is opioids. We're, we're extremely higher in uh, the rural areas of uh, the state. And uh, we say rural, but truthfully, that's Appalachia. Uh, rurality did not matter um, in areas of uh, health behavior outcomes. Next, please. As far as the social determinants of health, uh, we find that uh, income and education gradients of health, if you want to use Wilkinson's book, uh, by the way, I, I would say that Mel Bartley's work is a lot better than Wilkinson's. Um, basically, uh, um, the gradients of education and income uh, are very real in this state. Uh, food insecurity is very, very real in this state. Food insecurity measured as do you have enough food and do you have enough food uh, without it running out in the past year and in the past month. Uh, low income adults struggle with food insecurity much more. That's absolutely understandable. Loneliness, uh, UCLA's researchers uh, convinced us to look at loneliness as a proxy, not just for mental health, but uh, for environment isolation. And so uh, there's a lot of work now looking at environment isolation, and in particular with the pandemic, we're worried about this and what that does to people. So the loneliness uh, uh, concentrated among Medicaid enrolled adults, uh, and uh, basically this is an issue that we're gonna be looking at into the near future, uh, because when we set the proxy and we started analytically looking at other problems that just kept coming out. Uh, and truthfully, I had never, uh, me personally, had never really considered it that much of an issue, but it seems that it is very much an issue. Given the pandemic, we're thinking it's very, very much an issue. And then unkept, uh, unmet healthcare needs obviously uh, are substantially higher among lower income. Next, please. So Tim, we're almost yep. at 1246. I think just a couple of minutes. I know we're, we're cutting it short, but I wanted to leave enough time for folks to ask you and a before they have to scatter, so. All right, give me four minutes and we'll blitzkrieg it. Uh, we looked at substance use. Overall substance use uh, is a problem. Next. <laughs> Women's health. Women uh, are having difficulties in the state of Ohio. Next. I should have done it this way all along. Uh, as far as uh, demographics, uh, Medicaid population uh, dominated still by females, 19 to 44 year olds. Uh, and uh, that the population of who enrolls has not changed that much except for more white um, later middle-aged people because of ACI. Next. I'll let you read this on your own. We always get asked, how do you designate four county types? There's the argument. Next. Uh, overall, uh, what we'll do with this, next, please. This is the Ohio uh, Released Enrollees Survey. We actually went into the field and examined uh, the situation sort of in an OMAS-oriented way of individuals who had been released from prison who were pre-enrolled in Medicaid before they were released to see if, in fact, being released with Medicaid, uh, which would give somebody an institutional service guarantee beyond parole officers and a variety of other things actually helped. It helped immensely. Next, uh, I'll let you look at that. There's the data sets. There's that. Keep going to the end if you can. Stop here a second. Uh, make sure you pay some attention to this. You'll be surprised how uh, those who are enrolled uh, and those who are released go to every county. It's kind of interesting. Next, please. That says uh, this is the demographics uh, for those released. Next. Um, chronic conditions, higher. Next. Next. There's um, basically saying that 29.3% uh, of uh, respondents receive some kind of substance use treatment. Substance use treatment, which means that you usually have a substance use disorder, uh, is much higher among those who had been imprisoned. Next, please. Uh, we'll let you look at that on your own. Can you go to the very end? Thank you. I'll let you look at the statements. Keep going. Uh, go back one, I'm sorry. Go back, stop. The question is, oh, what's the bang for the buck beyond health to the justice system 
if you in fact put somebody on insurance and they have a place to go where they can constantly talk with somebody and get support for health, mental health and substance use, you decrease immensely the chance of going back to jail. All right, can you go to the very end of the slide deck, please? So for academic and academic applied research data uh, from these and other projects, there are quite a few of them, please contact either Dr. Ruhill or Dr. Lewis at the Hordovich School with an inquiry. And we uh, have a formal uh, uh, agreement with OU we will work uh, and give you the uh, protocol, which will be, by the way, uh, having an internal IRB from OU uh, to get people data for their academic work, uh, in particular, their master's theses, their dissertations. Uh, we help a lot of people get data um, and uh, OU has access to all this data uh, through uh, the gatekeepers, Dr. Lewis and uh, Dr. Real. To get the Q&A started, Dr. Lewis had a question for you uh, for the group. Can you tease out that distinction that uh, you pointed out at the beginning about the uh, work for hire and, and how some of the findings might be delivered um, in different sort of formats or avenues uh, related to some of the projects we discussed here today? Marsha, I'm not understanding the question. Can you just- Well, I didn't phrase it very well. I, and you addressed it later with uh, your conversation with Jack. Um, basically, I, I was interested in you describing, especially for the Master of Public Administration students on the call about how this work influences policy, even oh, okay, if it's not- it. So you're doing work for state agencies that people, that really the general public doesn't even know is being done. But you gave an sure. example with Jack's question about Medicaid and about how the Medicaid waiver program has certainly been influenced by looking at uh, the number of people who would be uninsured if um, they were kicked off Medicaid. So I just wanted you to, I just wanted to the students to hear about how this work informs policy um, sort of in the background. The GRC does a lot of work that basically is almost like uh, the old phrase of uh, a safe zone or a safe harbor. Um, a lot of the stuff we do, we never talk outside um, the GRC walls. Uh, for instance, I do a lot of work for Legislative Services Commission. The reason we take that approach, counter research for a lot of people is very real. Uh, in particular, not just associations or people that wanna make sure that they're looking out for their membership's interests. And that's fair that they're doing that. But uh, if a lot of things get out, somebody can distort, somebody may have a very good idea. There may be a legislator, we had one recently from Holmes County, had a very good idea. If it got out that this person was even entertaining how to basically serve uh, a subpopulation of people um, who, who are Anabaptists in uh, Holmes County, people would have thought of it as a carve out or whatever, they would have attacked a guy. And so what we do is go very neutral. Um, we hear crazy things as far as requests, we've had that. Uh, Dr. Rue himself has helped us deal with some of those. And we get very pragmatic things. So what happens is we take these data and we give it to them. What they do with it is, on, is up to them. We never recommend policy to the state. Now, do we sometimes when we get asked, say, do you think this is plausible with this work? It's fair game to say, given the distribution of this or given how many people you won't be able to find out, or this is such a rare event. No, won't work. No chance. Good luck. But we never come up with the policy recommendations for anyone uh, because we're the equivalent of uh, an applied research safe harbor group. And so when we did go on a limb to say, hey, you know what, using the federal unemployment statistics for this doesn't help the agency so much because the agency's uh, enrollment criteria is that you don't have a job, you don't have income. Uh, it could be SNAP, it could be WIC, it could be Medicaid, we've done all kinds of things. Um, in that sense then, 
what we do is we try to get the best grounded reality, which is the name of this presentation, right? To give to people so that there is no excuse for not knowing what's measurable or if we're doing a qualitative follow-up, what is the perception of the individuals who answer the questions versus the hermeneutic, uh, hermeneutical forced inputting of opinion to what is in fact the measured reality. And so counter research for a lot of these people, even at the local level with uh, the Franklin County commissioners, the Hamilton County commissioners, boards of health uh, commissioners, whatever, the counter reality is often very real and sometimes it can be subtle and sometimes it's just blatant. Our job is not to entertain that, but to say, okay, the phenomena that we measure is this indicating that. If that make, does that make sense, Marcia? Yes, it does, and thank you. Any other questions? I guess we can open it up at this point. I have a question. Uh, since most uh, Medicaid is delivered uh, under, through managed care organizations at this point, Yes. Um, you know, I would presume that they would, and of course, that's the whole, the whole idea of those organizations that they're managing care, which yes. means they should know the kind of information that you're collecting, they should know in order to make yes. decisions about care management. So I guess my, there's a couple questions. One is, um, uh, do you, do you exchange information with them? I mean, do they exchange their proprietary information they collect on utilization or information from their case managers or whatever about, you know, their experience in working with their, their Medicaid population with you and, you know, vice versa, do you share the survey information with them and have you seen policy decisions change from their end as a result? We do give them things if, in fact, uh, they go through uh, for Medicaid managed care, they have to go through um, the managed care office to ask. Um, and then we're, we, are, we are in the uh, email chain of that correspondence often, and it's pretty neutral ask. So they have the right to basically say, hey, can you have your people? Uh, and they do know it's us, but at, they generically talk about, say, the agency. We do, in fact, provide uh, different types of information. Usually for the managed care uh, groups, they are HEDIS indicators, which I'm sure you're familiar with, Jack. Mm -hmm. uh, we do all the HEDIS stuff. It's the HEDIS indicators and things like that, and the measurement and satisfaction indicators and um, uh, rehospitalization analyses and things like that. Uh, but we also give them uh, upon request, and again, it channels through ODM. Um, we will give them areas of their counties of emphasis uh, with, say, Molina or CareSource asks for a lot of things that are heavy and rural. Um, and we will basically give them information, but it channels through. Uh, we keep ourselves one piece removed on that kind of stuff, if it, in fact it is the Medicare, or Medicaid or Medicare program. Now there are some uh, managed care entities that will ask the Ohio Department of Insurance for information. We also do that. We also serve ODI. And so um, we make sure that that's not related to Medicare or Medicaid, it's private market or whatever. We also do that stuff. So yes, but we have them channel it because we're the government resource center and that's fine. We have them channel it through whatever the parent entity who would take obligation for the request. And the other question I have has to do with, you know, within Medicaid eligibility, there's a wide range of incomes. Sure. And we actually know from food stamp data that 20% of food stamp recipients have no cash income whatsoever. Yes. So, so, when you're looking at outcomes, you know, is there some prescription for providers out there that would say, you know, when you're dealing with people who have no income, which would be a substantial number of these folks, 
it's very different from dealing with Medicaid eligible people who are at the higher end of eligibility. That's right. Just in terms of resources they have available. So has have you looked at that in terms of your outcomes, you know, issues you're looking at, and then layered income on that as well? Interesting you'd bring it up. We, uh, <clears throat> we got an award uh, from various partners and foundations. Um, many years ago, Bill Hayes and I, uh, who's here at OSU now, um, and a couple of other people, did the homelessness and extreme distress profile. Right. We were, it, and it annoyed me that we couldn't get people to do it again periodically. We finally got the okay to do it again, which would be interviewing individuals, uh, not just in shelters or who have institutional footprint, but actually going into the street, the camps and stuff. Uh, I was on the Homeless Families Foundation for a while, so we had the inside edge. If you're asking, how would you do that? Abuse the system for a good cause. Um, but uh, we actually did get the okay to do exactly what you're talking about, along with uh, Habash's people in the food bank network and all this. Yes. And then COVID hit and I had to put the brake on. Uh, and we were annoyed, but we made the decision that I couldn't take um, OU, Mount Union, Cincinnati, Bowling Green, uh, Oberlin and a variety of other schools, Kenyon, and send them out there and disease their, their students or their faculty by doing this. So we are hoping uh, and are planning, in fact, Jack, if you want to contribute, uh, mm -hmm. to uh, going in and starting this uh, the 1st of October uh, in 2022, if the pandemic uh, lessens at all. Thanks. Yeah, I'd be glad to do whatever I can to help. Thank, Thank you. you. No problem. Uh, well, prematurely, thank you. <laughs> All right, well, I realize we are at one o'clock. Um, I wanna be conscious of your time. I know you are very busy. So thank you for sit, taking the time out of your busy schedule. To That's get the right, sorry we ran today. long. <laughs> well, thank you. We appreciate you taking that time and answering all of these questions and um, you know, giving us these slides to share out with everyone. Um, for folks that are on the call, I do want to let you know this is our last one for the fall semester, um, so stay tuned for announcements um, on the spring public service perspective series, and we do hope you all have a great weekend, you enjoy your holidays, and we look forward to seeing you in the new year. All right, thank you very much, everybody. Be Thanks. well. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank you, John. Yep. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, everybody. Hi, all.